afternoon and welcome to the BCA webinar. I'm uh, Paul Rupp, Executive Director of, of BCA. Um, this afternoon's the first of a number of webinars that we're going to be putting on over the next few months. Um, so keep an eye out for, for the forthcoming notifications of, of future ones. But I think today deforestation is, is on all our minds, particularly given the, uh, the announcement from the EU and the publication of their legislation last week. And I guess that's part of the wider sustainability and, and due diligence environment that we all need to be working in. Data and uh, traceability are key components of that. And this afternoon, we're going to hear from both trade in space and environment systems about how we might address those challenges. Um, we've got half an hour. I think there's an opportunity to put questions in the chat, so please do so. Um, if we don't get time to cover them today, we will get back to them afterwards. and, and uh, you will all be contacted with the sort of further details for both the speakers, although their, their details should also appear on the presentation. So without further ado, can I pass you over to our first speaker, who's Alex from Trade in Space. Thank you, Alex. Great, thank you. Um, I'm Alex. I'm Head of Operations and Programs at Trade in Space. Um, we're providers of technology solutions built with space data for the agricultural sector. Um, our focus is on servicing the coffee industry, and we use space data to create sustainable and transparent coffee supply chains. Um, like you, we've found that the most topical use case of satellite data recently is for compliance purposes to the EU DR legislation. Um, but when we've been speaking with our colleagues in the coffee sector, there's often a bit of a misconception or information gap on what's available and what's possible, um, what's necessary and what's overkill. Um, but most importantly, how can you actually use the satellite data to inform your sustainability policies? So today I want to look at um, where does the data come from, what is the data and what can you do with it? Um, so there's three key types of satellite, navigation, communication and remote sensing. We use all three but our focus today is going to be on remote sensing. Um, since the 70s, satellites have been taking daily images of the Earth's surface, which means we've got a wealth of resource to go back through 50 years and monitor changes. Uh, imaging comes in three resolutions. We've got low res, which uh, a pixel represents 30 meters or more of the Earth's surface. Medium res is around five to 10 meters and high res would be anything under five meters. Um, for agriculture, low res is typically what we would rely on. It's often open source and provided by NASA or the EU, and it allows us to provide information at a farm level, but at a relatively low cost and over a huge supply chain. Um, and all commodity supply chains increase cost, even a cent or two per bag is going to shift positions. So it's our belief that utilizing the most cost effective solution is going to be preferential every time. High res uh, does have its place in agriculture, but to give context on costs, um, the, to purchase satellite imagery, high res imagery of a 50 hectare um, coffee farm in Brazil, for example, could be upwards of $1,000. Uh, and that's prior to any kind of an analysis or processing that you would need to then do on it. Um, so to use it at scale is incredibly expensive. Um, we use it when we need to use precision, and we'll show you a really good use case of that in a few minutes. Um, but first up, let's look at what's most topical, which is deforestation. And um, so this is a view of Sustainamats. This is a calculation that looks at a baseline of forest cover from 2000, and then each year using a variety of satellite images, the loss of trees is measured. Um, so here, um, highlighted in red is the deforestation. Um, you'll find companies who monitor deforestation use a variety of methodologies. Um, some use high res in their own proprietary algorithms. Uh, we've done a lot of assessment and due diligence on this and our um, geospatial analysts have examined a lot of resources. But from our sort of business standpoint, we see huge value in supporting standardized data sets that are affordable and open to anybody. Um, so we use, <clears throat> excuse me, um, an open source data set called Global Forest Watch, which is provided by the World Resource Institute. Um, that receives $110 million in funding from governments and um, corporations every year. Um, and it's our position that any private enterprise um, would struggle to compete with that level of funding or the consensus that it receives. Um, so we know there's limitations with that data set and that's why um, our, our specialists and analysts can work to improve that. So we actually recently received support from UK Space Agency to look at how 
we can use targeted analysis to improve on the Global Forest Watch misclassifications. So here we've got a slide which shows coffee mapping. Um, this is a proprietary analysis layer that Trade and Space have developed to detect coffee. Um, so we know that from the legislation that's coming in, land which has already been developed into agriculture uh, is not subject to deforestation. So in this case, we've cross-referenced what is coffee farming and subtracted that from the deforestation to remove any occurrences of false positive deforestation caused by farming practices. Um, in situations like this, we've proven that we can detect coffee to a really high accuracy um, using medium or high res imagery. So we're targeting our usage, which means we can keep overall costs a little lower. Um, so let's move on to what else we are able to achieve with um, satellite services. We've recently partnered with Scottish Enterprise and the Can Do Innovation um, to create an aflatoxin risk map for maize on behalf of a client. Aflatoxins, they're not of considerable risk to coffee, but the same data can be used to inform crop health and other risks to coffee. Um, and we've used here a lot of climate data, so soil moisture, relative humidity and temperature from weather satellites to map the likelihood of an aflatoxin outbreak. So the client in question really wanted to view this by rainy and warm seasons um, in Rwanda and also wanted the risk defined by political boundaries in order to be able to take some action on the insights they're receiving. Um, using the same data with modelling and analysis, we can garner some really valuable insights for the coffee sector. So like maize, we can look at outbreaks of disease, um, and pests, and we can use imaging analysis to detect where the damage has occurred um, and perhaps use targeted insights for pesticide application. But if we move beyond just um, risk pests and disease, there's really valuable data for yield forecasting, resource allocation, market management, um, site specific interventions like um, shade planting or irrigation. And coming soon, we've actually got a frost damage assessment, which can be called on in the right climatic conditions. So I'm able to share with you a really early stage carbon layer service, which we're currently integrating into Sustainer Maps. Um, the view here shows the net flux of carbon, which is the exchange of greenhouse gas emissions between the forest and the atmosphere. Uh, we calculate this using the IPCC guidelines and by looking at the forest greenhouse gas emissions. Um, so this is emissions which have resulted from disturbance to the forest land, um, deforestation or degradation over the last 20 years, and we subtract that from the carbon removals. So that's what's been sequestered from the atmosphere. Um, these are measurements and calculations that are based on not just satellite data, but also a combination of modelling and LIDAR and ground sampling. Um, so using satellite images to verify sustainability of assets like farms or cooperatives is uh, only really possible when you actually know the location of the farm. So let me quickly show you one of the other satellite services that Trade and Space use in our toolkit. Um, so prompted by the EUDR legislation, a number of clients reached out for support in collecting location data like shapefiles or coordinate pairs. Um, so this is going to be required as part of that legislative change. Um, and in response, we created this mobile app which uses the phone's data, location data, which is provided by GPS. This is currently in use um, by agronomists collecting farm boundaries for cacao and coffee farms at the moment. And um, so we've looked at what the data is and where it comes from, but it's a really good point to look at how can you actually use this data. So looking at the data collected from Digitrack, for example, we can trace and monitor beans right back to the original farm, even down to the farm per bag. Um, so it's possible to trace the beans journey by what volume or value comes from farms which have been certified as deforestation free. Um, or thinking back to some of the earlier examples, um, we could cut this data to show what volume comes from farms which are at risk of frost or climate damage. And then once we start pulling these findings into dashboard overviews, we can really start supporting that corporate messaging and, and targeting our ground resource verification. So this means that um, this is probably one of the most important messages from today, especially when we consider that by its nature, um, analysis based on remote sensing is going to have an inherent um, degree of error. 
And so knowing where to target your ground resource for additional focuses is really essential. Um, so I'll quickly wrap up here um, and pass on to my colleague Gemma from Environment Systems. She's going to talk you through some of the results from a really exciting recent study that we worked on together. Um, but please let me know in the chat if you've got any questions, I'd be happy to answer um, or link in directly with me by email. So I'll pass over to Gemma. Thanks, Alex. Um, yeah, I'm going to talk to you about Arabica production and climate change in Colombia. And I have to say I'm grateful to my colleague Stephen who actually carried out most of the analysis for um, the project. Um, but let's crack on and uh, can we go to the next slide, please? So um, our study area is the Antioquia coffee growing region in uh, the west of the Colombian Cordillera branch of the Andes. So it's very mountainous, um, it's quite high rainfall, and you can see the coffee growing areas there in purple on the right. The main varieties are Tipica, uh, Catura, Castillo and Colombia. And so the purpose of our study was to assess how climate change is predicted to impact these areas and how it's going to influence the land capability and suitability for growing coffee. Next slide, please. We started with a literature review to identify the most important biophysical factors that determine the optimal growing requirements and limitations for Arabica coffee. Um, we know that there are differences in the growing requirements between different varieties. So we wanted to um, obtain information on what varieties were grown in our region and also what were the biophysical factors um, that were important for those varieties. So um, we did that by working with uh, Sukhafina and researching Seneca li literature that had been published um, to identify the varieties and the regional growing requirements. This allowed us to develop a rule set for modeling the biophysical factors in Colombia and in particular our region of interest and provided us some um, locations of coffee farms for validating our model. And this allowed us to adjust our rule set uh, to produce our final spatial outputs. Next slide, please. So we modeled a number of factors. Um, the uh, main factors were um, mean, um, average, uh, mean annual temperature, the minimum temperature of the coldest month, periods of low rainfall. So we were looking at consecutive months with less than 40 millimeters of rainfall, looking at extended dry periods, um, steepness of slope, um, and a range of other factors, but they were not considered in the final model. So things like um, soil carbon context, soil, soil texture, geology, and pH were not included in the study because the data was not found to be of sufficiently high quality. So you can see in that diagram here, what we did was classify the data into three classes, areas that are suitable, areas that are moderately suitable, and areas that are unsuitable for growing Arabica coffee. Each biophysical factor was classified in this way. So using rainfall as an example, we identify the amount of rainfall that makes an area suitable. It's just enough rainfall. And the point at which there is either not enough rainfall or too much. So um, areas that are suitable may be um, 1,200 to 1,800 millimetres. Areas that receive a little bit less or a little bit more would be moderately suitable. And areas with a lot less or a lot more would be unsuitable. So our literature review and consultation with stakeholders allowed us to identify these specific thresholds um, to apply to each factor, to temperature, to rainfall and to slope. We I, um, investigated three different climate change scenarios, a low, medium and high greenhouse gas emission scenario. Um, and we used the scenarios at three different time points. So the present day for representing early stage climate change, the 20 to 40 to 2060 time period, and then 2080 to 2100 uh, to allow us to identify trends and facilitate medium and long-term planning. Next slide, please. So when we combine the suitability, the classified suitability data sets for each factor, temperature, rainfall, slope, 
we come out with an overall suitability model which looked like this. Um, the maps here show the land suitability results for 3D greenhouse gas emission scenario. We have the low emission scenario on the left up to the high emission scenario on the right. And the, um, the colours represent a time series to show how the suitability of the land for growing coffee changes over time. The white areas are never suitable. They are unsuitable now and they're unsuitable in the future. The rest of the colours, the greens, yellows and browns, show places where the land is currently suitable for growing coffee, but this changes over time. Um, the dark green areas show places that are predicted to become more suitable for growing coffee than they are at present. And you can see little fringes of dark green appearing around the central mountainous areas. And this is most visible in the right hand high emission scenario map. Um, the dark brown areas show places that are currently suitable for growing coffee but are predicted to become unsuitable in the near future. The yellow areas show places that are currently suitable for coffee but are predicted to become unsuitable in the longer term, so closer to the year 2080. And these three maps just show us that the trends in land suitability change are the same under all three greenhouse gas emission scenarios, but the change is greatest under the high emission scenario. Next slide, please. Uh, the driving factors of these changes were temperature and rainfall, um, unsurprisingly. So the, the mean annual temperature and the um, extremes. And what we could see is that the um, areas at higher elevation become um, more suitable for production. And you can see an elevation map top right there. Um, those areas in purple are very mountainous, up to 4,000 meters. Um, but what we found is that even though some areas were becoming more suitable in the higher elevation zones, a greater area of land was becoming unsuitable in those lowland areas. Um, rainfall, annual rainfall is already relatively high and limits production, um, which was found to be a driving factor, particularly in, in, in the low moons. Um, next slide, please. So what we found was there are already challenges in the whole area. The area is already um, uh, moderately suitable, but limited by rainfall. Um, but there were some very clear trends in decreasing suitability of the land under all of the greenhouse gas emission scenarios. So under the low emission scenario, best case scenario really, we found decrease in 19% in the area um, of land that's most suitable for growing coffee in the region. Under the high emission scenario, this increases to 41% decrease in the area of suitable land. What we have to remember though is these models um, are purely about biophysical suitability. We haven't considered um, other factors that influence whether or not it might be appropriate to grow coffee. For example, environmental designations or areas important for mineral extraction. This, these are purely the, um, the biophysical um, factors that we've considered. Um, but a big take home message from the study is that land suitability for growing Arabica is going to change significantly in light of climate change. And these maps help us anticipate and plan for the change. And they also really highlight the importance of global efforts to uh, minimize climate change, to reduce the scale of these impacts as much as possible. Thank you very much, Jim. And I should say as well that um, this study that we completed with Environment Systems is actually available as a data layer on um, sustainer maps so um, you can see the the changes in um, suitability of that area and we've turned that into a risk score as well um, so I'd be more than happy to send some information out on that um, so if you do have any questions for myself or Gemma um, we'd be more than happy to answer those if you want to pop those into the chat um, so you talk about using coffee mapping to reduce the risk of misidentified deforestation. What about shade growing? Um, shade growing definitely is uh, a challenge. Um, we use not just remote sensing, so satellite imaging. We also use um, LIDAR and radar as well, and a lot of textual analysis. 
Um, so that helps us improve upon those, um, those results to improve the accuracy. Um, are there any updates to the EUDR? Uh, on the 16th of May, the most recent update that I'm aware of is that it's been passed by the, the council. Um, so it's coming into, um, into effect um, in 2024, I believe it is, um, starting with the large and medium organisations. Um, there is information on our website about that. We've got a, a blog post about all the changes that have come in. Has anyone on your team heard when the EUDR risk map may be published? Um, are you talking about the benchmarked countries, which are high standard and low risk? Um, we haven't heard on where those countries are going to be actually announced. Um, we did speak with somebody um, from US but fairly recently who indicated that it was going to be shortly, but couldn't tell us what they would be or, or when that would be announced. Okay, um, well, thank you so much um, for attending, everybody. Really appreciate your time today. Um, I hope that you found it um, to be useful. And please do reach out to myself or uh, to Paul or Gemma if there's anything that we can um, answer for you.